Greetings from Columbia Business School in New York City. I am Michael Wexler, a research scholar here at the Columbia Institute for Teleinformation and its Digital Financial Services Observatory project. Today, I am delighted to announce our reaching of a milestone, the pre-release of the actionable risk management framework that you're about to see. The ARMF is being presented by its primary architect and my colleague here at the DFSO, Keith Bowie. A questions and answer session will follow. So, just a short note about protocol before we begin. We kindly ask that all of you refrain from turning on your microphone to ask questions during the presentation. And instead, please use the chat button which appears on the bottom of your Zoom window to send your questions to me, Michael Wexler, the host of this webinar. Your questions and comments will be discussed with Keith following his presentation. And now I would like to hand over the virtual podium to my colleague, Keith Bowie. Keith. Thank you, Mike. Uh, pleasure to be with you today. My name is Keith Bowie. I'm also a research scholar at the Digital Financial Services Observatory at the Columbia Business School in New York. Uh, I've been with the DFSO now for about a year, and, and the bulk of my time has been creating this actionable cybersecurity risk management framework. For those of you who don't know much about the Digital Financial Services Observatory, it's a project of the Columbia Institute for Teleinformation within the Columbia Business School uh, at Columbia University in New York. City, which was founded in 1983, is led by Professor Ellie Noam and looks at uh, multimedia, mass media, uh, telecommunications, uh, and, and uh, has published countless books uh, that are recognized text uh, on the subject. The DFSO is led by Dr. Leon Perlman and was founded in 2016. Uh, the DFSO, we focus on the intersection of policy and technology and digital financial services. Uh, and Leon especially has, has traveled extensively within the DFS world and, and has created policy with regulators and is a very well respected authority in the DFS. Uh, we have a, about 6,000 or so people registered on our, on our website uh, and downloading our articles. Uh, and and we, we normally have, uh, in times where there's no COVID, we have summits, roundtables, we publish white papers and we have webinars more regularly than we have been. Uh, our website is at the bottom and, and these slides will be issued uh, at the end of the, at the, end of the uh, webinar. So today, as we said, we're going to discuss our, our cybersecurity risk management framework, but a little background on, you know, why, why do we need cyber risk management frameworks? Well, you know, not, not every cyber risk is the same for every organization. So organizations have to prioritize how they're going to spend their cyber resources, how they're going to allocate resources, spend money, et cetera, to ensure that they take care of the cyber risks that affect their organization. So in order to help along with that, having a set of standard processes and procedures that, that actually um, correspond to a potential framework is a very good idea and is very well looked after by regulators and, and auditors. You know, my, my background uh, was corporate technology before this, and we had many federal and state regulators in, in, in New York State that would look for this kind of guidance and this, this kind of approach to ensure that your cyber defenses were up to the standards that your organization was expecting. So our ARMF, so the, the background on this is um, we, we're, we're able to do all of this work at the DFSO thanks to generous grants from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And as part of the current grant cycle, uh, they had requested that we look at cybersecurity protection and reaction within the digital financial services ecosystem. So we want to make sure that the, the product we're delivering is, is the best one we can deliver. Uh, and our aim for it is to ensure that organizational operations and services are contained within a safe and secure environment. Transactions can be tr uh, executed uh, confidentially and securely and can find access to only the parties that need to be party to the transaction. And we can provide both proactive defense and defense advice and reactive advice on how to deal with a breach or a threat if, if that's if such a thing occurs. So our methodology was was took a little bit of time to get to get our heads around how we would do this. Now, you know, not all participants in the DFS ecosystem provide the same service or have equivalent capabilities. 
And we wanted to make sure that none of the participants were disadvantaged by the, the publication of this, um, this framework. So we've created it based on our maturity model um, uh, methodology. So the maturity, we have six maturity levels uh, that cover, that we believe cover all the participant capabilities within the DFS ecosystem. We've built it on international standards because, you know, there's, there's plenty of very, very capable standards out there that, that, that can be used, so such as ISO or NIST or COBIT. So we've built our framework on top of those as a foundation with some IP um, that, that we've created ourselves. Um, we've also attached a set of processes to each of the each of the, the capabilities that we, we cover. So we don't just say you should do this action, but we actually give guidance on how to do the action as well, which we believe is one which we believe is one of the differentiators for our framework to other ones that are out there. And as I mentioned before, we're providing two main components, preventative processes and reactive processes. So our design approach is, is pretty standard amongst, you know, sort of academic researchers where we've performed some research, created documents, done a bunch of reviews internally. We, we then convened um, some expert panelists who were, who were cybersecurity, they came from cybersecurity domains, uh, digital financial services domains and financial inclusion. So we then had a couple of rounds of reviews with, with, those, um, with those experts, which got us to the point where we started to disseminate the framework to additional companies to do evaluation or beta testing. Uh, and we have, you know, we have almost 20 of those organizations giving us feedback at this moment in time. So our intention is to incorporate that feedback into the final publication. So the, as I mentioned before, we've built this on a cyber hygiene maturity model. And there's three main pillars there. There are cyber maturity, where, you know, depending on the capabilities of your organization, you practice is very little or you have a very sophisticated level of maturity. Process maturity, which would be making sure, you know, at the highest level, you have consistent processes throughout the organization um, and working back from there. And then we have organizational maturity. You know, do you have the staff to do to do um, the cyber, the cyber protection you need? Do the staff have the right qualifications? Do they have the right skills? So those three pillars bring us into a, a maturity model uh, that we that we you've got in within the framework. From an operational overview perspective, um, we have created a participant matrix where we have grouped uh, DFS actors or participants into, into a, a predictive maturity. Um, so some of the feedback we're looking for is does that does that matrix make sense? And, and not, you know, obviously we have actors that can span a couple of maturity levels depending on whether they are sophisticated, so they're, they're more sophisticated uh, than someone who's potentially a counterpart. So reviewing that participant matrix would assign a cyber maturity level, and that would then take you into the preventative processes and the threat matrix according to that maturity level. So from a timeline perspective, we started just over a year ago doing this from a blank sheet of paper. Um, and we've come through, as I said, reviews, et cetera. And our intention is to incorporate the beta test feedback that we've been getting over the last kind of month or so into the, um, into the framework. And we will publish uh, at the end of January 2021. Uh, all of the materials that we'll be discussing today are available for download or viewing on our website. Um, and as I said, these, these slides will be made available afterwards. So you don't have to be scribbling notes. Um, Michael will send out uh, details of, of the locations earlier on. And, and we encourage you to please visit the website, download the materials, and, and if you would be so kind to provide feedback to us. The feedback, the, the page itself has got some documents um, of which the two main components are the, the operational and the, the, sorry, the threat matrix and the preventative processes. But there are also some user guides and executive summary on there. And we also have some instructional videos which cover uh, the operation of the, of the framework. Uh, and one document that is missing and will be issued with the final set is the, a, a paper that covers uh, why we did it and how we did it. So from a maturity level perspective, as I mentioned before, we have created a group of um, actor classes and put actors within that and assigned a maturity level. And the feedback we've had so far is that the maturities that we have assigned are, are 
pretty good uh, from my guests. We've changed a couple based on feedback, and we've added a few participants based on feedback. But in the main, our um, our, our, our kind of estimate has been has been well received, and and this would be one comport one part that we would encourage feedback on to make sure that we have the the right the right actors in the right boxes. So. As I said, there's two main components, preventative process and threat matrix. So a preventative process component is based on a set of international standards of, of cyber domains. Um, so we have a, a set of domains, for example, asset management or identity and access management, instant response, governance, et cetera, which those of you who are cyber experts should be very well familiar with. Within these domains, we have a set of capabilities or principles, depending on your terminology. Um, so an example would be, you know, for asset management, identify your hardware assets, software assets, et cetera. For governance, it would be, you know, do you have a cybersecurity framework? Do you have a policy and procedures in place, et cetera? Then within each of the capabilities, there are a set of process goals that we have that will satisfy the capability itself. So, you know, for if we keep on the asset management side to to identify all the hardware assets, the process goals would be to compile and document the hardware assets within the organization. And then the crux of the matter here is the actual processes themselves. So in order to actually identify and document the hardware assets, there are a set of process steps that you would go through to actually satisfy that capability. Uh, and, and this is consistent throughout the, the framework. The, the domains, capabilities, process goals are consistent from level one through level six. The actionable processes themselves differ according to the maturity level. And at the lower level of maturity, say one or two, some of these may not be applicable because if you have maybe an agent who's sitting just with a point of sale terminal, they don't need to do go through a whole rigmarole of process to actually catalog a, a set of hardware that maybe a credit union or a microfinance institution have in the cloud or sitting on a, on a data center somewhere. And then there is a success indicator that indicates, you know, what you should look for if your processes are executed um, successfully. Now, from a process perspective, we haven't gone to the level of um, endorsing products or vendors. We have taken it to a point where we believe it makes sense for an organization to understand at the micro level from a process perspective what to do. And organizations can then tweak the processes uh, any way that they wish to. So again, we're not, we're definitely not endorsing vendors or products or platforms at this point in time. So from our, our Preventative process count here, as you can see, the domains on the left hand side, we've got 10 domains in total. Um, and we have um, a bunch of uh, capabilities, there's 83 in total. And then we have process goals, which total 107 and processes 113 by level. Now, as you can tell here, not every single process is unique. There's some processes that cross boundaries, um, and, and those are marked in the, in the framework itself. That we have indicators that, that tell you a process is the same between, say, level three and four, and where those are different. So they, those, are, those are noted throughout the documentation. The threat matrix component uh, is, is basically how to minimize the, or how to respond to a, a potential breach or a threat and how to minimize the impact. So due to a, a research and to Dr. Perlman's extensive traveling, we've managed to categorize um, threats into groups, looking at the main threats from the ecosystem that, that are more prevalent to particular actors. So we've kind of grouped those threats into categories like social engineering or mobile communication infrastructure or mobile devices, et cetera. Then from this perspective, we've, we've listed what the threat is, what the impact of a successful uh, execution of the threat would be, just so that so that people are aware of you know the impact of its if, if, if the threat becomes a problem. Then we have we have defined a generic response for each threat. You know this is how you can respond to the threat um, just from at a micro level. And then we've gone a little bit one step further than we have in the preventative. So we've taken a threat response the generic threat response and then tailored it for each maturity level 
but we've gone to each actor as well. So if you have two actors at the same maturity level who provide different services, the response may be slightly different. So we, we've actually tailored it to, to, to determine you know, a particular actor and a response. Um, and then, you know, our total at the moment is there's 82 threats uh, across the, the, the different groups. There are nine groups here. Um, and and that, that, that is listed in, in the component and the documentation that you, you will see later on. So, as I mentioned, we have gone through, you know, expert reviews to get it to a point where we're happy to issue it out to, to, to organisations for further input. So the beta test itself are the, the, the two components, as I mentioned, are preventative processes and our threat matrix. Um, and the beta test has two main aims here. So we'd, we'd really a, encourage you to take part. We'd be very grateful if you could take part. Um, what we would look for is, is feedback on the content itself. You know, does, does, does the content make sense? Should we be adding content? Uh, is, it, is the content sort of describing uh, at a good level uh, of the, you know, of, of, of that would be understandable by the participants? Um, does, does the scope look okay? You know, so all, all around, all, all around the, the, the content of, of the RMF itself. And then secondly, you know, can it be used in anger within your organization? So on an, on an operational basis, could you use it in its current format? Um, and I do recognize that it's all documentation at the moment and followed, following the presentation, we'll, we'll go through some plans that we have for the future. But we'd really like to understand, could it be used operationally? And, and if, if so, that's fantastic. If not, then, you know, could you tell us how we could tweak it so that it could be used? Um, and then, you know, maybe maybe participants can't provide feedback on both, uh, maybe just one. And, and as I say, any feedback would be wonderful. Um, we have got a bit of a tight timeline now. Um, so we, we really like feedback by kind of on or around January the 8th. And we're going to publish this at the end of January. Um, so as I mentioned, um, uh, we we're kind of getting us out the door at the end of January. Now we do have plans further down the line to a keep the framework maintained. So we, we don't want this to be a one and done. And, and I don't think that it's it's possible to have a one and done as, as threats and, and, and cyber criminals uh, become more sophisticated. These kind of frameworks have to be updated. So not only are we looking to maintain it ourselves, but we'll put it out to a community site to look at, you know, for community input and how we can modify it as well and, and beyond january um we have plans to kind of do things do other, do other things to the to the, the framework itself and one of our main things is to be um looking to put it into an application-based um interactive tool and uh, more interactive than it is just now so that potential users could could actually you know put notes in against how they're satisfying some of the principles how they are you know how, how they're how they're adapting their their processes compared to what the standard processes we have in place, and potentially attach you know evidence that this is this is what they're doing for auditors or potential regulators to actually look at um, you know how how these organisations or your organisations are practicing good cyber hygiene. Um, so I think sweeten to the point. Um, that was that's our presentation on the RMF today, um, and now I'll open the floor up for any questions. Mike, you're on mute. Mike, you're on mute. Yep, I have unmuted myself. Thank you, Keith. I was uh, thanking you for uh, the presentation, which was uh, expeditious and sweet and to the point. So I'd like to uh, open up the floor to questions and uh, comments. And as I'd mentioned earlier, please use the chat button at the bottom of the Zoom window to send your questions and comments to me, Michael Wexler, your webinar host. Uh, and I will submit them to Keith. So why don't we begin? Um, while I am looking at the window, I will start with one. How about if we begin with entry points into using the ARMF? Uh, Keith, what approach should actors take to determine their maturity level for using the ARMF? Well, 
at the moment, uh, the best the best way we have is through our maturity matrix that I showed you earlier on. Uh, and as I said, we would be looking for feedback um, as to whether that maturity matrix is, is valid or not. And just, at the moment, we haven't had any great objections to it. And, and I should have said during, the, during the, the process, look, any feedback is welcome, you know, negative as well as positive, um, because the more feedback we get, the better the product that we will, we will look to get out there. But looking at the maturity pillars that we have, I think if you look at the pillar, the three different pillars, and look for your organization about where and what box you fit, um, you know, you could be in box three for one and box two for the other, or four and three, et cetera. I would then look at the taking the lower level of maturity to make sure you cover it. And as you go through the processes, it can all can it can also work as a as a check a checklist on am I doing these things? And if, if you are doing them, but to a higher standard than than what than the level you've entered at, you could potentially say, well, we're actually a level higher than we thought we were. So it works as both a both a reference guide and a checklist as well. And in terms of any questions with regard to that, um, we'll have uh, we'll be able to make ourselves available to be able to help yes, with determining yes, those yes. maturity levels. Yeah, so so Michael, our contact details are here. And as I said, the slides will be sent out later on um, after, the, after the webinars. Um, we're available for calls or emails, uh, et cetera, if, if you, if you download, the pay, uh, download the details uh, of, of the, or, or the artifacts that we have, of which after the webinar, you know, as well as sending out the, uh, the slides we have here, Michael send uh, an additional email with the, con the, the content uh, uh, URL. Okay, great. So we have a question here from Satyajit who asks, who is the target audience for the RMF? Is it governments, regulators, DFS providers, cybersecurity consultants? As DFS is a cross-cutting field with intersection with tech providers, financial institution providers, and governments. Yes, great question, thank you. So, so our target is the DFS participants or providers. Um, we, at the moment, we, we've slanted it towards organizations or, or DFS participants. Um, we do have regulators and governing bodies evaluating the framework uh, as part of our beta test. And longer term, we would look to, tar we would look to partner with regulators and, and, and uh, regulatory bodies uh, or central banks to see whether we could use this as a guidance tool towards legislation or whether we can use it as a monitoring tool for participants. By the moment, it's slanted up participants. So we have another interesting question from Norbert, who asks, regarding the threat matrix, do you consider also some kind of weights to be assigned to the various categories, for example, probability or potential damage level? Um, we will, we will do in the future, Norbert, and um, thank you for that. At the moment, we have not. Um, and that's one of the areas we're kind of, we kind of we were pressed for time to get this out the door. So if a future enhancement is not is not only to do that, to assign capability or probabilities or or the, the, the risk of a, a successful breach, but also allow organisations to do it themselves rather than us assign a blanket um a, a blanket score it would because of each organization the threat may be different uh, across organizations we would allow organizations themselves to put in some probability or pro probability score which could then come out and and um, actually dictate to them you know where their biggest risks are yeah you, you had mentioned that this is a living document i believe earlier so in terms of yeah. progress these things aren't expected to be done in a day and we're yeah. very glad to work with people um in our audience please reach out to us um so that we can make continuous enhancements to the armf so um i'll actually a, a raise a question which i was thinking about which uh came up earlier this week perhaps you could discuss a little bit more about some of the issues that have arisen with some of our collaborators and some of our expert panels. And I'm thinking one in particular, which I worked okay. on in a cybersecurity and gender paper with regard to some of the most popular attacks in DFS. Yeah. So so we've had, in the main, we've had positive feedback to to the, uh, the framework itself. So nothing horribly negative, which is good. A um, couple of things that we've, we've been asked to do is one, um, put a little bit more cloud, um, uh, components in there which which will do about how you protect against cloud and the the, the services that 
DFS participants are gravitating towards the cloud. So we will do that before it's published at the end of January. Um, some more on payments, um, payment-specific threats, which, again, we will get some done. I'm not sure that we'll get it all done by the end of January, and that will be a continuous um, input after January. Uh, and one very interesting component um, from some one of our colleagues in Africa uh, was about the lower levels of maturity and, and both illiteracy and digital illiteracy. Uh, for customers of the DFS uh, ecosystem. So, so while our framework is kind of aimed at the participants, um, we've, we've agreed that we would partner with um, this organization to actually try to get some um, easy, easily understandable, um, digestible material around about, especially around about um, uh, spoofing and smishing on mobile phones to try and trick people into doing transactions with bad actors. Um, and that was that was a very interesting comment that we had. And, and we, Michael and I are kind of looking at how we do that um, uh, with, the, with this organization. Thank you, Keith. Um, I have another question from Jean-Louis who asks, how is the rollout planned after the pilot phase? So we, we're going to do a couple of things, John Louis. We're going to put it will be made available on our website as it is just now, and we will we will update the documentation that's there over the course of the next eight weeks or so. Um, and and people who have who have registered to download will get the update messages. We're also going to put it onto community sites as well for community input and community adoption. Uh, and and for for things like changes on maintenance that we will look to do. We, we for the, at least for the short term, will be the gatekeepers of of um, uh, of doing any maintenance tasks. Um, but we will hopefully at some point maybe form a working group or a governance group that can actually look at the best way of of in, introducing changes. But we'll, we'll make, we haven't decided what community sites to be available that will be available on as yet. We're working with both um, uh, our partners that we've been. Uh, 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 doing the expert reviews with and the Gates Foundation about some mar marketable platforms that we can get the information out to as many people as possible. And, and, and if there's anybody that has any ideas on, you know, platforms we could put it out on, we'd be absolutely happy to take um, feedback on that or guidance on that as well. So I've noticed a couple of people have arrived a little bit late. I uh, just wanted to mention that we are actually having another session of uh, the ARMF presentation tonight. Well, it is uh, 9.30 a.m. in the morning in New York now, but at 10 p.m. tonight as well to accommodate our uh, friends globally. Um, so if you have any questions and you'd like to join us also later at 10 p.m., please do so. It should be in our invitation. And you can send any questions to me at the email address on your screen. Um, so uh, please do so. I do have another question for you, which is an interesting one, something which uh, is about insurance and compliance. So some thoughts maybe you can share with us with regard to using the IRMF for insurance or compliance purposes, which is probably quite relevant um, as to news uh, lately. Yeah. Uh, so uh, as, as I mentioned before, you know, we were kind of looking at while longer term we'd love to sort of have this um, be a component of potential regulation or be adapted to conform to regulation. Um, we do believe that using a framework to to manage manage your your cyber resiliency or uh, cyber protection um, is good practice and will be looked on favourably by regulators or auditors or or in fact as you say insurance companies. And I think that you know cyber insurance companies will look, will look for you know are your policies and procedures sound? Are you following a methodology? What are your incident response plans, etc.? What are your business continuity plans to make sure that you have um, a are protecting according to your risk profile and b that any incident that happens will have a minimal impact and that business can continue as usual so so it's definitely um something that we've had some feedback on that say this could be a useful tool to to help with cyber insurance um uh applications i think also interestingly we actually got um comment from from a couple of participants that bilateral contracts could could actually use this to 
make sure that as you go into um, business with another vendor or, or a, another uh, organization within the ecosystem, that you know you can prove to them that your cyber resiliency is at a level that is applicable to your business, and that could actually be written into a contract. So we've actually had feedback from, I think it's about four organizations now, that they would be very um, open to having something like this in bilateral trade uh, trading contracts or vendor contracts with organizations that they deal with. Thank you, Keith. Um, I think we have time for just one more question, maybe a short wrap up um, for now. What are some of the most popular questions that we've been asked that maybe you could cover for our audience here, which were asked and discussed with our panels and experts who worked with us during the beta period? Um, so, so I think, you know, the most popular question, we've kind of covered most of them today. We've been getting similar themes across, across the questions. Our experts themselves, when we started out, they helped us hone the the content of, of the framework across the, the 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 major components of the DFS ecosystem. So that 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 part was really driven by the DFS and the financial inclusion folks. Some of the more technical parts about how you then put good cyber hygiene into your um, into your framework was was kind of driven by the cyber components and and the maturity model we, we didn't actually didn't start off looking at a maturity model that kind of appeared literally about a year ago just about last christmas time um where a couple of our expert panels mike and i actually sat down and had a very long session interactive session with them physically when you could do things physically uh, at the university and they got us around to the fact that, you know, given the wide range of capabilities within the ecosystem, a maturity model really would suit. And, and then we kind of thrashed out what, how a maturity model would work and what the pillars would be within that maturity model. So that was a real kind of light bulb moment for us literally about a year ago uh, now. Um, the other themes, as I mentioned, you, you kind of covered in the questions here. Um, I think the payment one, uh, including more payment, um, specific items uh, will come up more because of quite a few of the folks we've spoken to are either in the payment provider um, business or our central banks who are, mo who are monitoring payment transactions and security around payments. So I think that one is going to be key for us to make sure that we, we implement or we document those. So we, we had one more interesting note, which uh, hopefully you can shed some light on. Uh, so the comment was with regard to work being done in West Africa, um, that there it was shared that it's challenging to have it self-administered in emerging countries and need some support with regard to that uh, with yeah. the administration. Maybe you can yeah. speak to that. Yeah. So so that's well understood, and and you know as I say, while you know while we really we really would like input from um, you know organizations that are taking part. We have actually been speaking to central banks and regulatory bodies, communication regulatory bodies, about the framework um, with the view to them using it as a, a supervisory or monitoring tool. Um, so completely understood that maybe in the first phase, organizations might say, hey, this is great, start, start to implement it and then kind of drift away. So our, our real game would be earlier in our next phase as we get to do things to engage the regulators to actually help govern the the areas or the participants of which they're responsible for so that that would be something that is it's definitely at the forefront of our our, our roadmap uh, but is you know unless unless the regulator regulators come back with feedback that they are going to use it right now um will be a little will be probably a few months away before we kind of get them actively engaged to help do it uh, help um help and not enforce but help use it as a monitoring tool and one other thing i i wanted to mention is that as as we get further through our next phase we have i have very positive communications with some um, regulatory bodies about potentially attaching a certification process to the framework for the particular areas that they, they regulate. Those, those um, conversations are very early days, but there is a will there to actually um, take this forward. Thank you, Keith. You know, each time you give this presentation, I always see something new to go ahead and add. One of the items that I don't believe we mentioned is that we have a page that has all of the documentation that you spoke about on our website that's available for any of you to um, 
to review and to provide feedback for us. Keith, maybe you want to address that? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, after, as part of the, the kind of post uh, webinar activities, Michael will send out uh, both the slides and access to our, our page, our page on our DFSO website, where all the artifacts are available for people to, to download. Um, as well as the artifacts themselves, there are like a user guide, um, and there's also some tutorial videos that people have uh, reacted to very positively that actually helps people understand um, a, each individual component and how they interact together. So they're, 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 they'll be available uh, in the post webinar uh, It's a very interesting um, matrix that you've put together. And I'm just wondering, you know, what happens to someone at the lower end and how quickly do they need to really invest to move up to need to have a degree of safety and protection? Okay, so, um, so obviously I think it, be, it, it depends on where they are just now. And, you know, the, the, the framework itself, as you'll see when we issue the, the documentation, at the lower level, not everybody has to have the same level of protection. You wouldn't expect an agent who's maybe sitting in a in a bodega somewhere with a point of sale terminal to have the same level of protection as a multinational bank that's got a branch in the capital or something like that. So so what we've done is we've given we've we've made the processes at the lower end really very straightforward and and We've actually kept the domains, the capabilities and the process goals consistent throughout, whereas some of the lower levels will actually just be non-applicable because if someone's sitting with just a single device, single point of terminal device, they don't have to do an inventory of hundreds of watt stations or whatever. So I think depending on the service it provides, the protection or, or the, the reaction to a potential incident is, is kind of based on their capabilities, their, their hygiene and their capabilities applicable to them. We're not, we're not suggesting they do something that's beyond their means because that's just not practical. So we, we, we do have one more question, uh, which is asked from our audience. You'd mentioned that basing the work on ISO and NIST standards, could you tell us if those standards are similar or did you have to integrate them both? It's a good question. That's a good question. Not so. They are reasonably similar. So word for word, obviously, they're not similar, but they do cover the same topic. So as I showed you the domains earlier on, the domain language may not be exactly the same, but they do cover the same types of domains. So so asset management is one that's covered in both, and it might be I think it's called device management in one or, or asset management in the other. So they are very similar. And and as you'll see when we, we kind of get the, uh, the, the information out to you, in each of the, the capabilities we have, we do actually have the ISO and NIST references um, and, a, and a COBIT reference as well. Now, the COBIT reference we have is, is COBIT 5, not the latest version, which is COBIT 2019, I believe, was, was just earlier on this year. So we'll look to update that with the latest versions. But, you know, as a theme, they're, they are similar and they cover similar topics, not necessarily exactly the same language. So it wasn't too big a job to actually get something that's consistent or, or get something that we could we could map as consistent across each of the different standards. So um, looks like we've got another question or just another comment from a, a friend of uh, the DFSO. Good to see you, Peter. Thank you for joining us late. And yes, we're glad to accommodate our friends around the globe and wherever you may be. You're far away, Peter. Peter uh, mentions, he says, he can see it being useful for procurement processes for developing nation governments approaching DFS service providers. Maybe you can just have a quick comment about that. And also, I want to mention to everyone, this will be our last call. For any questions that you may have, please send them to me in the chat box. I'm glad to go and send them uh, over to Keith. Keith, maybe you can... Yeah, Peter, that's a really good point. I think, as I mentioned earlier on, we, we came across this kind of bio, the potential bilateral use case. But I can see what you mean that, you know, as as, as uh, central procurement agencies want to do stuff with participants, they could insist that they have a, a certain level of protection in place or a certain level of maturity in place. So I can actually see that as being a, a really good use case, similar to the bilateral uh, the bilateral case that we gave earlier on. So that's 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 the first thing that was mentioned, but I can see that's really, really, really useful use case. Any final thoughts that you have with regard to the process and 
that you can share with our audience. Yeah, so A, I'd like to thank you all for joining. Um, it, it's been a pleasure to host you, even though it's a little bit late here in the States. Um, um, I think one of the things we are, we are looking for is the more feedback we get on the framework, the better product it is. And, and we want to put the best product out there we can. Um, so I, I would, you know, ask that, you know, when Michael sends the, the post webinar uh, information out with the page where we have all our artifacts, that, you know, should you be inclined and be willing to give us feedback, we, we'd love to get it. And, and any feedback is good feedback. You know, if it's positive, fantastic. If it's negative, then that's still okay because we can then shape the, the framework to take account of the, the, the negatives that we see into something that's positive. So, you know, any feedback we can get from you would be great. As I mentioned, you know, we, we've got about six weeks now before we actually get the final framework out there. So, you know, we would be happy to, you know, a, you know, if you have questions when we release the documentation, please contact Mike or myself. Our contact details will be on the slides that will go out to you as well. Um, and we'd be happy to jump on a call with you at any time of the day. We're okay. Okay, Keith, it looks like we're just about out of time. We wanted to keep this session short for those of you who joined us late. As I mentioned, we'll be doing this again in just over 12 hours from now at 10 p.m. New York City time. Um, Keith, I really enjoyed the interesting Q&A session this morning and working with you on the ARMF. If any of you in the viewing audience have any questions or feedback or would like to reach out to us, please do so using the email that you see on screen. We'd much enjoy hearing from you. And so on behalf of my colleague Keith Bowie and all of us here at the Columbia Institute for Teleinformation and the DFS Observatory Project in New York City, thank you for joining us today and we look forward to seeing you at our next event. Goodbye for now and stay well. Thank you very much. Stay safe.